Okay, Romans chapter 11, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 25. We'll read to the end of the chapter. We will finish up Romans 11, and uh, probably if you're looking, you say, goodness gracious, we're almost finished with this. I can't wait till that guy is done. So, Romans 11, <coughs> um, verse 25. So we're picking up really in the middle of this whole thing. We're actually it's toward the end of the whole context, but we'll pick it up here. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regard the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments! How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So Paul is continuing now his discussion here that began in chapter 9 concerning his ethnic kinsmen, the Jewish people. Every chapter, 9, 10, and 11, begin with some kind of an expression of Paul's concern for his Jewish brethren. His discussion in the previous chapters um, kind of sparked the rhetorical question that chapter 11 begins with. Uh, he, he spoke about he says things like, all of those who are of Israel are not of Israel. He spoke about God's electing grace. He, he spoke about the message of salvation being taken to all people, to Jew and Gentile. And so those kinds of things may have caused him to think, somebody's going to ask me this question. And so he says in 11.1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? If all of this is true that he has said about not all are Israel are of Israel, not all are, are the children of A Abraham just because they are the ethnic children of Abraham, if there are some that God has chosen, Esau, Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated, and if the gospel is to go to the Gentiles, then what does that mean for Israel? What does that mean for the Jewish people? Has God rejected his people? And, of course, his answer is a very firm, by no means, not at all. Um, the Jews have not been rejected, and we looked at this in chapter 11. Uh, the Jews have not been rejected, and this is how Paul uh, illustrates that. He says, because I am saved. Paul says, I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Jew with an impeccable pedigree, and I am saved. Therefore, God has not rejected his people. He says the Jews have not been rejected because others have been saved. He talks about a remnant. There is a, a, a remnant within the whole body of the Jewish people who have been saved. And then he says the Jews have not been rejected because the acceptance of the gospel by the Gentiles provokes the Jews to jealousy and then some of them come to Christ. So God hasn't been done with them. And he says, uh, he says also, they are now being saved. I mean, just look all throughout the book of Acts. Acts 14.1, Acts 17.10. It talks about a number of Jewish people who come to Christ because when Paul went to a city, he went to the synagogue first of all. 
proclaim the gospel. Some of the Jews believe, but then others who are not Jews also would believe. So he's concluding this argument, and, and really this concludes the doctrinal section of the book of Romans uh, with this final answer to this question. Has God rejected his people? And he says uh, that God has not rejected his people because salvation will come to Israel and God's people will be saved. And that's his argument in verses, uh, verses 25 uh, all the way to 32. <clears throat> now, we read these features in this passage. That first of all, blindness came to Israel, it says in verse 25, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. He doesn't explain what that means. So let's be clear about that. Blindness has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Now, a lot of people have assigned a meaning to that, but Paul does not tell us what he's talking about here. He just says that they are blind, probably judicially blind. If you think about um, Isaiah's commission in Isaiah chapter 6, which is an interesting passage, you know, where the, he sees this vision of the Lord and he hears the angelic creature saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then he hears this call, uh, who, will, who, who will go for us? Who will I send? And Isaiah is full of zeal. He says, here am I, send me. And then God says, fine, go and preach. So their hearts will be hardened. I mean, how about that for a missionary commission? Go and preach to people who will not listen, who will not respond. You will not be successful. You will not build your mega church, buddy. It's not going to happen. In fact, you're going to eventually be martyred. Yeah, I, think, I don't think I'd opt out for that. I think I'd opt for that one. But maybe that's what he's talking about, that this blindness has come upon Israel but until the fullness of the Gentiles have come, we don't know what that means. The second thing that we read in this is that it says all Israel, this is thus, all Israel, in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now that the whole issue clusters around what is meant by all Israel. What is he talking about here? And there are several ways that you can understand that. In fact, let me give you four different ways that people understand uh, what Paul's talking about here when he says all Israel will be saved. First of all, some think that it means all without exception. Every single Jewish person. All Israel. There's a guy uh, that used to have a radio, uh, radio show. He may still, I don't know. Uh, and... Uh, he says, listen, he said, it's, it's very simple. Whenever you read the Bible and you see the word all, all means all. That's all all means. Well, all doesn't always mean all, right? If you go to, uh, you go to a Chinese buffet, it's all you can eat. It's not you can eat all. So all doesn't always mean all. Depends what we're talking about. But this is the idea that all without exception is the idea of what some people call bicovenantalism. Uh, is a view that has gained uh, renewed popularity, especially in the face of renewed support for the modern state of Israel. Um, it says that all means all, that there is a Christ covenant for the Gentiles, and there is a separate Torah covenant for the Jewish people. Uh, here's, here's how somebody explains this position. Uh, all Israel, they insist, must refer to the people of Israel as a whole over the course of history. Paul makes no reference to Christ here. Grounding the salvation of all Israel in the promise of God to the patriarchs, as in verse 28. Thus, all Jews are saved due to the validity of God's covenant with the nation of Israel. And that's what that position says. Because you'll notice in verse 26, it talks about all Israel. Um, in verse 28, it says they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. And in verse 32, it says that he may have mercy on all. 
So that's the issue of bicovenantalism. Um, of course, there are some obvious problems with that. I think you can see that. Neither Paul nor any other New Testament writer uh, teaches any route to salvation apart from the saving work of Christ. Uh, even in this passage, look at verse 27. It says that, that he, uh, uh, he must take, a, that when I take away their sins. So something has to happen for that to be accomplished. And as far as scripture goes, there's only one way that that is accomplished. And that, I think, is huge. For, uh, to, to claim that there is salvation for any apart from faith in the saving work of Christ empties any definition of Christian. There can't be. It, 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 what Jesus says in, to Jewish people in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man, it's very emphatic, no man comes to the Father but by me. And he wasn't kidding with that. He wasn't giving any loopholes. It, he didn't say, that is, unless you have a Torah covenant, then you can get in just because you're a Jew. I would say that if this meant all without exception, every Jewish person, then Paul's praying and his desire that he expresses at the beginning of all these chapters uh, doesn't mean anything. Why would he desire his ethnic kinsmen to be saved? Why, did, why would he say, I could wish myself a curse from Christ for their salvation if they were okay to begin with? And Paul talks about those who are the enemies of the gospel. Is he telling us that they would be saved anyway just because they're related to the patriarchs? It certainly was not Paul's personal experience. Why was Paul converted? Why did he come to Christ if he was a Jew's Jew and uh, a member of the covenant? The previous passage, Paul's talk, spoken about a remnant and so he's told us, I think pretty clearly, that he does not mean all without exception in mind. But that's one way of looking at it. Secondly, some people say that all Israel actually refers to the church. All believers, regardless of their ethnicity. And that's uh, basically the standard Reformed view, though not everybody who would consider themselves Reformed uh, uh, believes that like that. John Calvin is representative of many uh, who hold this view that this actually speaks of the church, the unified people of God. And most people who, see, um, who hold this position uh, see most of the references in the New Testament to Israel is actually referring to the church, now comprised of Jew and Gentile. This has been called by some uh, replacement theology, which is kind of a slanderous uh, term, actually. It infers that those who hold this position now believe that, God, that the church has replaced God's original plan for ethnic Israel. And they're implying that this is a novel idea forced upon Scripture. Uh, in reply... Many Reformed people would say, well, uh, who says that God's plan was, in, was uh, intended only for ethnic Israel? In fact, uh, they would say that uh, uh, the covenant to Abraham seems to include more than just ethnic Israel, that in, in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Um, <clears throat> Maybe the Old Testament people are a forerunner of the larger people of God, comprised of both Jew and Gentile. The third way of looking at this is that all Israel speaks of a future restoration of Israel as a nation. And this would be called the dispensational view. The political entity known as the modern state of Israel may be a forerunner of this, but the promise uh, to Abraham that his seed would, would, would possess the land is to be ultimately 
and literally fulfilled. Uh, this view, uh, in some people's mind, comes close to what they call now a Christian Zionism. Uh, it's a, someone said it's a political theology that says that modern Israel, in this view, is not like other countries. It is the outworking of God's plan foretold in the scriptures, and therefore, modern Israel's political fortunes have profound theological and spiritual consequences. I was in a Bible study last week, actually, when uh, someone was saying that, well, you know, God tells us in his word that we have to support the state of Israel. And it's pretty close to, to this position. Um, it's kind of interesting uh, that a dispensational interpretation is rooted in a literal interpretation of Scripture. And they would say that any deviation from a literal interpretation amounts to allegorizing or spiritualizing, and it detracts from the main from the plain meaning of the text. Now, I, I agree with that in principle, but there's a difference in interpreting Scripture literally and interpreting it literalistically. Um, listen, the only ones that really interpret Scripture literally here would be those bicovenantalists because all means all to them. And even a dispensationalist will hold that, well, God doesn't intend for all Jews without exception. All Israel means all saved Jews. All uh, Jewish believers, maybe those who become believers during the tribulation period because of the witness of 144,000. That's who the all Israel, so they even, even they who would hold to a strictly literal interpretation, qualify the word all. <clears throat> if this passage does speak of a future for ethnic Israel, if it does, it doesn't provide the details for that. Paul's concern in these chapters, in chapters 9 through 11, uh, is for his ethnic kinsmen scattered all throughout the many nation states, and he desires them to be saved and, and, and to be saved and as Jews become the children of promise, as he says in chapter 9, verse 8. He says, not every Jew is a child of the promise. So he, he wants them to be saved that they might be. Uh, to say that this speaks of a restoration of, of national Israel, I think, reads something into the passage that is not there. Uh, dispensationalists tend to look at the modern state of Israel as it exists now and read that back into the scripture. Um, if you uh, see that the Bible teaches a restoration of Israel as a nation, uh, you sort of have to construct that by connecting a lot of different dots. And fourthly, the fourth way to look at this is some people think that all Israel speaks of the conversion of a significant number of Jewish people. And some think that this may occur near the time of Christ's return. And others think that uh, this conversion of Jewish people will be accomplished all throughout history not in some post-historical age. Paul seems to be talking about something that's taking place right now as, as he lives. Um, again, the fullness of the Gentiles, he doesn't tell us what that is, but there's no indication that that is a time that indicates that there's a clock that's ticking and that clock will end and then something will happen. If the conversion of the Gentiles provokes the Jews to envy and brings many to salvation, in this way, all Israel will be saved. By the abundance of Gentile conversion, fullness sometimes means completeness or abundance. The same word is used elsewhere to talk about the fullness of the deity of Christ. And there seems to be some kind of a 
reciprocity in this in verses 30 to 32. Jewish obedience, Jewish disobedience, produced Gentile faith. And Gentile faith produces Jewish obedience in faith. And so in the final analysis in verse 32, he says, uh, uh, so they've been disobedient in order they may, uh, by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. So in the end, it's all the mercy of God. <coughs> it's all a matter of the grace of God. <clears throat> so, what do we make of this? So here's just some, some application. It does seem to be the case that in Romans 11, Paul talks about God's plan for Israel as a people. <clears throat> that shouldn't be confused with Israel as a political entity. Again, Paul seems to be speaking about um, the Jewish people, not the Jewish people in a particular geographical location. It's his ethnic kinsmen. Now, what I am about to say may seem heretical to you. So don't stone me. But the modern state of Israel may have absolutely nothing to do with this text. It may not. If God is going to restore the nation of Israel, they will be gathered in faith. And the modern state of Israel is anything right now, anything but a place of faith. They're mostly agnostics. It also seems that, that ethnic Israel is in view here. Uh, at the beginning of this section, Paul's concern is for his kinsmen. Uh, it's not to imply that every Jewish person will be converted. He is speaking of a remnant. He says that in verses uh, 4 to 5 of chapter 11 and also in chapter 9, verse 27. Be careful that you don't read this because some people say, okay, you know, so what do we do with Romans 11? Well, I'll tell you what we do with Romans 11. We read it in the context of Romans 9 and 10. You can't just pull this out by itself and read it. Uh, so make sure that we keep this in context. It also seems clear in the scripture that the Bible speaks of one people of God, the bride and the body of Christ, where there is neither Jew or Gentile. Ethnic, uh, social, all of those distinctions fall apart. They fall away. They dissolve in Christ. Uh, you can read that in Galatians uh, 3.28, Ephesians 2.14, Colossians 3.11. This one people seems to be inherent in the promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed because of him. Of course, that's because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and this seems to agree with the earlier statements he made in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, and not all are the children of Abraham because they are his offspring. There's no indication of a separate Jewish believing entity, as in Israel and then the church. There's only one people of God. And Paul, a Jewish man who came to Christ, considered himself part of the one body, not a subset of that body. He is, there are one people of God. <clears throat> the conversion of the Jewish people, should this happen, will be through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how Peter, Paul, John, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, all Jewish people, that's how they were saved. Not by keeping their Torah covenant. Not by virtue of the fact that they were Jewish people. They were saved because they came to Christ. Paul says in Romans 1.16, there's only one gospel for the Jew first and also for the Greek. It's the same gospel. It's the same way of salvation. That, that the Jews or even the Gentiles, as far as that goes, are chosen or elect does not conflict with the proclamation of the gospel. 
In fact, that motivates the proclamation of the gospel. So in Acts chapter 18, Paul is in Corinth, and he's really discouraged. I mean, he's preaching, he's doing what he's doing, and nobody is responding. And he's about to give up. And the Lord appears to him in a vision in verse 10. He says, Paul, he says, take heart. You have to continue because I have many people in this city. What are you talking about? Nobody's been saved. But the Lord says, I've got many people, and they will be saved, but only through the proclamation of the gospel. At least understand this, that God is still saving Jewish people. And the fact that he is still saving them now means that he has not cast aside his people. And let's also add this. Uh, just because we may not, maybe I, see, maybe I may not, uh, see the nation of Israel as having any bearing on the prophecies in Scripture does not mean that a person is by default anti-Semitic. There's no room for anti-Semitism among Christians. I know that there are some. I've talked to some who believe that if you don't believe that that is God's doing right there, and if Israel, uh, if you don't believe that God put that there as a fulfillment of his prophecy, if you don't believe that, then you are anti-Semitic. I've, I've heard that. Uh, that is not true. It's an unfortunate slur. So chapters 9 through 10 have been awash in, with a lot of intense doctrine. Um, and actually, the doctrinal section of Romans ends here. And so the doxology in verses th uh, 33 to 36 is a fitting bridge between the doctrinal and the practical section. He starts off, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. This magnifies the wisdom and the knowledge of God that is beyond our comprehension. <clears throat> Friends, we can know what God has revealed, but we can't know any more than what he's revealed. And in God, there is much more. There is much more than he has disclosed for us. So we can't know what we haven't been told. Uh, this speaks of his inscrutability. That's one of those really interesting words. It means you can't figure it out. You can't understand him. You know, how does a husband understand a wife? You can't. It's not possible. It doesn't work. We can't understand God. And too many times, as someone uh, humorously said, that we dare not try to unscrew the inscrutable. We can't do this. We don't have all the answers. Verse 35 speaks of uh, an attribute of God that we call aseity. It means that God is complete within himself and needs nothing and owes nothing. And then there's that benediction in verse 36. And really much more explanation of this benediction would really detract from its beauty. Uh, God is, is inexpressible. He's knowable but he's not completely knowable. So if, 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 uh, uh, if you think you, you've got all of this figured out, think again. And not that there's any, any virtue in not knowing, but sometimes um, God reminds us that he is God and we are not. So we'll leave it at that, and we'll look at chapter 12 then. Uh, next time. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for what you've told us. As much as we have, we need to be aware of and to study and to learn, and yet we can't know all of it. We can't know everything of that, that there is to know. But, Father, we're thankful that you, by your Spirit, uh, teach us the truth that you've revealed. And so help us. Help us to know it. Help us to understand it and help us to live it out in our lives. And, of course, we don't want to, to lose the responsibility that we have uh, to proclaim the gospel. Even 
uh, in the light of all of this about uh, Israel being converted and Jewish people coming to Christ, uh, regardless of all of that, uh, we are told the importance of proclaiming the gospel. And so make us gospel-centered and gospel-oriented people. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.